Hi, my name is Ellen Weinsapple, and I'm a product manager at Epicypher. This video is part of a series on the basics of chromatin mapping. In other videos, I covered the fundamentals of chromatin structure and gene regulation. Here we will review the basic steps of the most commonly used chromatin mapping assay, ChIP-seq. So let's delve into an actual chromatin mapping experiment. Before starting, you have to collect some information. First, what are your samples? These are the cells or tissues you want to use for mapping. Second, you have to select the targets you want to map. This refers to the histone PTM or protein you want to map in your cells. In my example, I have two samples, wild type and mutant, and I want to map two targets in each of them. Third, calculate how many reactions you need to set up. It is important to remember that in mapping assays, you can only map one target in one sample per reaction. So for my example, to map two targets in two samples, I need to set up four reactions. I also need to make sure I have enough of each sample to perform two reactions. Now we will go into the actual assay. CHIP-seq stands for Chromatin Immunoprecipitation Sequencing. The first step is to cross-link cells, which stabilizes targets on chromatin. This step is important to optimize, since too much or too little fixation negatively impacts yields, background, and data quality. You then lyse cells and isolate chromatin. The chromatin is fragmented into small mononucleosome pieces. Chromatin fragmentation is another challenging step to get right, and also needs to be optimized for each cell or tissue type. After fragmentation, add an antibody to the target of interest, which binds nucleosomes containing your target. For histone PTMs, it is essential to use a rigorously validated antibody, since many antibodies to histone PTMs show nonspecific binding activity. You then use the antibody to pull down the nucleosomes associated with your target. This is the immunoprecipitation, or IP, step, and includes a series of stringent high salt washes to fully strip unbound nucleosomes and reduce nonspecific background. Unfortunately, these washes can also result in loss of your target-associated nucleosomes, particularly for weak chromatin interactions or if the antibody has low binding affinity. Additional optimization may be required. After pull-down, you digest proteins, reverse cross-links, and purify DNA. Then you prepare what are called sequencing libraries. This process adds unique barcodes to each reaction, so sequencing data can be assigned to the correct reaction during data analysis. After library prep, you're ready to sequence. Sequencing produces millions of short reads, and these reads correspond to where your target is located across the genome. Scientists next align or map these reads to the matching sequence in the genome. Here I am showing a small segment as an example, but sequences are mapped genome-wide. Mapping the reads allows you to know the amount of target at each location in the genome. This is called enrichment. Areas with many aligned reads have high enrichment, while areas with few aligned reads have low enrichment. To visualize data, aligned reads are normalized and used to generate sequencing tracks. More mapped reads or enrichment generates peaks in sequencing tracks, and no enrichment means there are no peaks. Again, tracks are generated for the whole genome. We are just looking at one area here. But you can look up any gene you want and see how much of your target is bound. We used ChIP-seq as our introductory example because it has been the standard chromatin mapping tool for many, many years. But it is not the only option. How do scientists select an assay for their project? It is important to think about the number of cells. High cell requirements limits the analysis of small samples and how many targets you can map. Processing time and throughput are also key. More steps increases the risk of sample loss, makes it difficult to perform multiple reactions at one time, and slows down data generation. Simplicity of the workflow is also essential, since complicated assays lead to higher variation and more user error. The major cost of chromatin mapping assays is sequencing. More sequencing per reaction increases costs and restricts experimental scale. 
And finally, you want data specific for your target with low off-target background. Reproducibility across reactions is also crucial. So how does ChIP-seq measure up? Well, despite its widespread use, you might be surprised to hear that it fails every single one of these metrics. It requires millions of cells. It's not ideal for rare or precious cell types. It takes approximately a week to perform an experiment and has been hard to adapt for high throughput. Many steps require cell or tissue specific optimization. The harsh wash steps during IP can also reduce target yields. ChIP-seq requires many reads per reaction and is the main cost of the assay. And even with these investments, the resulting data are often poor quality and unreliable. CHIP has had a dominant hold on the field for decades, not because it is an ideal technique, but because nothing else was readily available. CHIP was robust enough, but improvements are clearly needed. To address these problems, Epicypher offers katana, cut and run, and cut and tag assays for ultra-sensitive chromatin profiling. Our assays and user-friendly protocols pass each metric for assay selection. In side-by-side -side comparisons with ChIP-seq, you can see that cut and run and cut and tag require fewer cells and have lower sequencing costs. Katana assays are also much faster. You can go from cells to sequencing in as few as two days. Furthermore, the data are greatly improved. There is less background and more robust target signal. Check out our other Chromatin Mapping Basics videos to learn more about cut and run and cut and tag assays, or visit our website for additional information. See you next time!